One pink and one blue and then... This is perfect for this. Yeah. Okay. 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 I have to have so is accessorizing this. Uh, Can you believe this? The best. Isn't Thank that the camp? Oh, we have to go? Okay. Here, okay. Paloma. Here, you hold it for me. I want that. Our name she is on that. Sure. Okay. We'll see you in a minute. See you in a minute. Okay. Bye. Hey! Savvy and we'll be back later in the show. All right, plus LA Law's Alan Rakins. And some terrific kids who are baking cookies for our troops in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and a look at marriage after rape, how these brave guests cope. We'll also, a controversial issue. Should HIV positive health professionals be allowed to practice medicine? And blue jeans like you've never seen them before. Let's do it. <laughs> Now, here are your hosts, Linda Dano and Dee Kelly. Well, they are thousands of miles from home in the heat and the sand of the Middle East, but the servicemen and women of Operation Desert Shield are really in the minds and hearts of those back home, especially home economic students in Fairfield, Connecticut. They launched Operation Desert Shield, baking and shipping 12,000 cookies to Saudi Arabia. Let's give them and home economics teacher Barbara Fox Gulia a warm yes. welcome. Hi, Barbara. Hi. Tell, tell everybody, Barbara, how this project got started. I had read an article in a local newspaper, and it was uh, from another high school, and students had made cookies to send over. And no home economics teachers were involved, and I thought with home ec, we could do a lot more than they yeah. did. Who participated in the project? Uh, all of our home economics students that were currently in classes, and it was one, our one high school and both our middle schools. Right. Let me Three ask schools. one of these students. How, was it fun to participate? Did it, did it give you something special? Well, it, it was a lot of fun to participate, and it brought everyone together. How? Well, we knew that we were doing something good for everyone, and it gave everyone a good feeling about the project, and everyone worked together and helped out. Where did you get all the flour and the sugar and all of those things? Uh, from donations. From donations? Yeah. Now, weren't you the mascot? Yeah. And what'd you wear? Uh, I wore a camouflage suit and um, I wore a camel's head and I had a, a <laughs> helmet on my hand giving out cookies to seventh graders out in the uh, lunch shift. Now, that got their attention, huh? You also put messages in the cookies. What, what did the messages say? Well, they just like tried to more to keep them like ha at home, more feel more at home. Do you want me to read it? Would you? Yeah. It says, "Dear soldier, enjoy the cookies and please come home as soon as possible. We really miss you. Love, Meredith Morgan." Did any of the servicemen or women write back to you yet? Not yet, but we're hoping that a few will. I bet they do. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. nice. Now, Barbara, has this brought the kids together? I think it did. Finally, working all together and actually having the high school and the middle school, it's really nice to see all the grades, the 6th through 12th grade, working together. And uh, there was a serviceman who came to the school, wasn't there? Yes, we had someone from the Army Reserve come to both of the middle schools. And he talked to the kids? What did he say to them? Uh, basically, he had with them, uh, I guess it was chemical warfare gear, and he had samples of the food. We had set it up in the cafeteria, so mm -hmm. it was kind of fitting, and mm -hmm. he had samples of the food that they would be eating in Saudi Arabia which wasn't too pleasant. It wasn't any good, huh? Yeah. Now, you have an apron here. Yes. Show everybody what this apron is. Okay, it was with our logo that we had designed, um, the Operation Dessert Shield, and we had soldiers sitting on a camel eating a cookie, and we had the names of our schools in the town and then the teachers that were involved with it. I think it's great. Are you going to bake more cookies and send more cookies? Um, not right away, I don't think. I think we've kind of cooked ourselves out at this point. Hopefully... You yes. won't have to be baking very long, huh, right. gang? Yeah, Hopefully this would be the only one you'd maybe need. 
What a great thing to do. Thank you very Thank much you. for being here. Thank you for all us Americans. You <laughs> did a great job. You really did. L.A. Law's very own Douglas Brackman is next. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Are romantic? No, not on my behalf, no. Why? I went out with one and it wasn't that exciting. He wasn't so romantic, huh? No, very boring. Well, let's see what you think of this guy. Our next guest plays an attorney on L.A. Law who's had more than his fair share of romantic relationships. Let's take a look. Douglas, I love you. Somehow I fell in love with your stupid bald head and your little pessimistic idiosyncrasies. I'm absolutely crazy about you. Marilyn, all my life, I viewed myself through my father's eyes. I know that's unhealthy and probably stupid, but the bottom line is he'd never approve of you and me. But he's dead, for God's sake, It Douglas. doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Please go. Please welcome the multi-talented Alan Ragens, everyone. What did they say? Lawyers were romantic or were not romantic? I couldn't hear. Actually, she said no, not on her part. She did not find that. That actually, this guy was quite boring. <laughs> Obviously, that has not happened to you with all the love relationships you've had on this show. I've had a lot of different relationships on this show. What about real life? Is this art imitating life? Were you breaking hearts? Always as Alan Rachens as well as a Doug Brackman? Well, I'm a married fellow for the last... Uh, 13 years, actually. And let's tell everyone who you're married to. Married to Joanna Frank, who Wonderful uh, actress. played um, Sheila Brackman, who is now my ex-wife on L.A. Law. Yes. And um, I guess I did a lot of dating when I was a single person. Now, you had a very interesting um, group of questions that you put to any perspective. Well, that's date. because I had dated all through my 20s and have not really settled into a serious relationship. And I wanted to settle down. And I thought if I asked some serious questions, maybe it would help me just uh, separate the wheat from the chaff. I what were they? <laughs> what were the questions? So what did I ask? I asked uh, if the relationship got into trouble, would you go into therapy? And I asked, uh, if, do you want to have children? And I asked, um, how do you handle anger? Because I'm very direct with my anger, and I, I, wouldn't, I would have trouble dealing with someone who ran out of the room whenever you raised your voice kind of thing. Now, I didn't just say, hi, let me ask you my three <laughs> questions. You know, I hopefully had a nice evening. But in the course of this evening, these questions just sort of got snuck in there. Now, how do you know that they told the truth? I mean, what did Joanna, your wife, did she answer truthfully? Well, she answered correctly, but she later told me that she lied. <laughs> but she didn't really lie. She just, uh, as it turned out, she answered more or less truthfully. She just didn't know it at the time. Well, you have a fabulous family. You have a son? Yes. Eight years old? Boy eight, yes. And what's his name? His name is Robbie. He's in the third grade now. And you have one child? Yes. Why no more? Well, I guess because we started a little late. I think that's really why. Uh, we got married in our mid-30s, and it just uh, worked out that we started late. And you're the, one of the original Mr. Moms, we hear. Well, I was home alone with him a, a lot at the beginning because uh, there was no L.A. Law at the time, and uh, Joanna was teaching acting, and I was home uh, with Rob. He, but he, it was, he lived in the backpack for a while. Was, I thought it was a growth coming out of me. <laughs> I couldn't get it off, and I ate this way, and he was there an awful lot in the backpack, Let's pounding on my head. <laughs> Let's talk about the beginning a little bit. Talk about a struggling actor and a real uh, success story. You really hung in there. I did. I did hang in there. And what kept you going, Alan? Well, uh, a couple of things. One is that I really wanted to do this, and I had something to prove to myself that I could do it. And another thing is I didn't know what else to do. <laughs> so it was those <laughs> two things, you know. And uh, 
And what, one of the things that was very hard about it is having all your other friends start careers and families and getting their life moving and becoming adults and feeling like you're being left behind, you know. So uh, uh, along comes the show and suddenly with a big fell swoop, I'm neck to neck with all my friends, which is a great feeling. It is great. And I read you saying that you just would love this to go on forever. Well, it's, I'm having a good time and the scripts are wonderful, so it's, it's very nice. The last time you were on the show, uh, not too long after that, you did the Thanksgiving Day Parade in New York, and you did something there that a lot of your fans might not get to see you do that normally, <laughs> which was? Which was sing. Sing! That was great. I had a wonderful time doing that, although it was cold. On that float, I'm going to huh? tell you, it was cold. What did you sing? You're the top, a Cole Porter song. Can you give us just a little bit of that? Uh, just a little. Go ahead. Strike up the band. <laughs> you're the top. You're the Coliseum. It's a, it was a good song. I had a great. good time. And... and um, and out of that came a, came a phone call to do a La Cage, a fall in Florida, which I, which I did last summer. But did you think you were going for one role or yes, another? Yes, yes. Well, what it's, happened? It's, a, it's the part of these uh, two gay men. One is kind of uh, debonair and macho, and the other is a transvestite music hall performer. And I assumed, since I had sung You're the Top in the top hat and uh, tails, that he was calling me for the debonair fellow of the, of the couple <laughs> and we talked back and forth for a month about a few months actually and, and finally we were meeting in the agent's office when we realized oh the, what a horrible misunderstanding it's the other part he's in drag yes we it, might in add. drag and I have to say you looked absolutely beautiful <laughs> as a woman Doug Brackman as a woman is that something now there you are a full and there woman. you are as a gal <laughs> doesn't he look great thank you <laughs> Now, where did you, you're a pretty big guy, where did you ever find shoes and clothes? Did you have to shave your legs? No, that I didn't have to do, but I did have to find shoes and wigs to get started, and that was very hard to do. And I went into a few stores that people had misdirected me in saying, you'll find the shoes in that store. Oh, this is you funny. You know, and I say, hi, I'd like a high heel, I wear a size 11, and you know, I say, Aren't you the guy from L.A. Law? Oh, we don't have the... Oh, it was, it was very embarrassing A little confusing for, a while. for your image, But huh? I, found, I found the right shoes, finally. Someone told me where to go, and then I was looking for wigs. Now I took my son Robbie with me when I went wig shopping because I thought that I would look like just a normal dad shopping for wigs. Sure. <laughs> with a body wave, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, uh, there was uh, a Chinese man and Robbie both saying to me, Dad, you, you look good in the blonde, I think, with the curls, you oh, know. that's <laughs> very cute. <laughs> Did you enjoy that? Did you get um, any insight into being a woman? You know, Dustin Hoffman talks about that after doing Tootsie. I guess Tootsie. one of, one of the, uh, the insights is that, that there's that aspect of being a woman that's the performance. And mm -hmm. I think that was explored in M. Butterfly, that when you put high heels on, it's a little bit like a stage. High heels are, are kind of like a stage. And now, in addition to being a person, the person that you are, you're expected to also do other things that are... Uh, seductive, alluring, um, all sorts of things like that, which... Um, it's very interesting. Which was interesting. What about pantyhose, Alan? Pantyhose <laughs> was a problem. They Where got did you get pantyhose that, that we're gonna... Well, they got, actually, pantyhose that were too big for me, because if I really put them up to my waist, it could have gone up to here, and bunching at the ankles, and it was very annoying having, you know, my wife and the guys in the chorus saying, Alan, pull up your pantyhose, you know? This Just, is uh, so funny. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it's great it to have great you here. It was a great show, though. I love doing it. And what's next? Are you going to do some more? Well, I'll do, uh, I'm, I, I love doing theater, and if that opportunity comes by again, I'd love to do it. Well, maybe we'll bring you luck. We'll see what Good. call you get after you. It's <laughs> lovely to have you here great again. To have you too. Thank you Thank so you. much. <laughs> next, can a woman find true love and marriage after she's Thank been you. great? <laughs> we discussed this in a moment. Come back. Most women who have been raped report it to the police. No, I don't. Why do you say that? Do you know someone who has been raped? No, fortunately I don't, but um, a lot of women are scared. A lot of rapes are committed by people who are known to the victims. True. Yeah, so uh, no, I don't believe that they are reported. Okay. 
Every day, more than 259 women report they have been raped. But many law enforcement officials believe the true count may be as much as 10 times greater. But even after women report a rape, they still have to live with the memory of their nightmare. Can they ever trust a man again? For most, the answer is no. Joining me are Christine Nicolucci, Chrissa Dawson, and Valerie Tamas. Please say hello to these ladies. What's your name? <laughs> Christine, tell us about the night that you were raped. What happened? I was at a party with a bunch of friends, and um, we were hanging out and having a couple of drinks, and I had three wine coolers, to be exact. And um, I had to be home by 1 o'clock, so I had asked one of the people in the house, or I just said it in general, to please wake me up by 1. So I figured five minutes leeway, I could be a little bit late. So then, um, around 12 o'clock, this man woke me up by coming on top of me. Did you know him? He was my friend's, uh, friend's brother. So I had just met him once before. And when you say he was on top of you, he was trying to rape you? Exactly. And I was fighting him. I fought with him for about 40 minutes, and then he pulled a knife on me. And then I just thought I was going to die, so I kind of... Gave in? Yeah, I, exactly. Out of fear? Right. What happened after it was over? Did he, he just got up and left? After it was over, I was looking for um, the light switch to find my clothes because he took my shorts off. I was wearing mm -hmm. shorts and a sweatshirt, a Miss Piggy sweatshirt. And um, I was looking for my, my shorts and he wouldn't give them to me. And then I couldn't find a light switch. So he was taunting you. Right. And then finally he threw my shorts at me. I threw them on. And he says, um, can I have a kiss? And I said, no. But he did anyway. And then as I was leaving, he stood in my way and he said, um, I promise me tomorrow when you see me, you'll be able to look me in my face. And I says, I never want to see your face again. Did you see him again? I just briefly passed him in the car once. And Did that was you report it. him to the police? I reported the incident to the police um, three days after it happened. And um, I didn't go through with pressing charges. I had just been told that my mom was um, terminally ill with cancer. And at that point, I was so emotional and very uh, suicidal that I couldn't from deal with. From the rape? With, from the rape. and from yeah, the mom. From from the fir mostly from the rape and then with my mom on top of it. I just couldn't emotionally handle it. When you say suicidal, what, what changes have you gone through since this happened to you? Well, I don't try and kill myself anymore. I mean, I don't think about it. Um, I've, I've gotten more sure of myself. I'm still not very um, self-confident. You know, I still feel that I'm not pretty. And I still, you know, have a lot of negative feelings about myself, but they are getting better. Do you date? Um, Is yes. that a problem? Well, no. I well, I date. I've been married and divorced also in this time since, period. Since since the rape. Yes, I was married, and then I became divorced. And do you think the divorce was a, a result of the rape? No. 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 The divorce had nothing to do with my rape. Uh, my ex-husband was very good with me as far as my rape went, but as far as relationships, I am afraid to date. I'm afraid I only date with people that I know or people who have told me, you know, right. about this person. But I don't go out on dates with people that I don't know. Krista, tell us about when you were raped. You were in the Caribbean yes. on a holiday by yourself. Yes, I was. What happened on that beach? Um, I just got up from the chase lounge that I was on, and I decided to take a walk down to the other end of the beach, which is something I had done every day. Mm -hmm. um, and this particular day, it was noontime. And I walked down to that end of the beach, and I noticed somebody in the bushes, which is very common because those beaches are all just shrubbery, and um, a lot of the natives just access the beaches through those shrubs. And I noticed a young man in there, but I didn't think anything of it again because it was perfectly normal. Um, but I walked to the end of the beach, and I s looked behind me, and I saw that he was walking behind me. But again, I didn't really think that I was in any kind of danger because... There were people up and down the beach all when day long. When did you know you were in danger? When I got to the area that I intended to go to, and I went in the water, and I turned around, and I saw him just sitting on the sand watching me. And then I knew that I was in potential danger, and I decided to just get back to where you were. Get back? Get back to the place that I was staying at. To the hotel? Right. And what happened? Well, I started to walk back towards the hotel, and he was coming down from the bushes, um, like, coming at me and he was talking to me as he was coming down. What was he saying? Uh, I didn't know what he was saying until he finally got right up to me and then he asked me if I wanted to have sex with him. And I said, um, no. 
and I tried to walk around him, and when I tried to do that, he grabbed my wrist and drew a knife on me. Pulled and you into the bushes? He pulled me up to the bushes and threw me down on the sand and straddled me and raped me. After that rape, and he left, did you report it? Yes, I did. I went back to the hotel where I was staying and reported it immediately to the manager of the hotel. And did they catch him? Yes. Um, she called the police immediately and they came down and I took them back to where it had happened. And later on that evening I had to go back and identify him. How did you feel about yourself afterwards? Did you feel dirty? Did you feel spoiled? Did it affect your relationship with your boyfriend? It, it didn't affect my relationship with my boyfriend, but I felt dirty. I felt damaged, like my boyfriend would never ever want to touch me again. And that was all I could think of at the time. Um, I spent a lot of, I spent a year in, in therapy and I spent a year in hell dealing with all the all feelings that I was having. And the month <coughs> after I was raped, the same young man raped and murdered two women. So I had new feelings of guilt because you I'm lived. alive yes. and these two women are dead. I bet. Um, so there's just been these tremendous amounts of issues to deal with when you're through the recovery process, but. Valerie. You are with Brides Magazine, and you wrote an article, uh, Marriage After Rape. Yes. And someone close to you was raped. Is that yes. what m made you interested in this particular subject and write about it? Yes, I've written uh, various articles for newspapers. And um, when I actually am not with Brides, I'm a freelancer, but oh, Brides got in you, touch with I me. See. And because they felt that if a woman did not resolve the issue, did not work through the process of her rape, it would have a profound effect on for her, her whole life for her whole life on a relationship on a marriage on her sex life on everything and uh, it, it's it right to me brides pick the right audience because yes. every woman who gets married buys a bridal magazine and if she hasn't dealt with it uh, her chances of happiness are pretty doomed. pretty doomed now after a woman is raped Christine and, and Carissa can they ever trust again can they trust a man I think they can. I think you should ask them. I think it takes time, and I think it takes counseling. Um, it takes a sensitive partner, and it takes um, it takes group therapy. Yeah. But I think you can. But I think you have to work through it. Do you? And I think these women are working that through way? it. Are you working through it's it? It's a very strenuous process. But ha and you've and made I, progress. Yes. And I think in my case, where I had somebody in my life who was a very sensitive human being, and I knew I could trust him. And it, I think that's probably why our relationship has really not been damaged as a result of what happened to me. Do you feel if something were to happen to him, could you trust any man again? I've thought about that a lot, and I'm really not sure I know the answer. That must scare you. It's, it scares the hell out of me. Christine? I'm learning how to trust. I am. I'm, I'm, I went through the process by myself. But you I didn't mean, go to therapy? I did go to therapy as far as um, uh, family and stuff. I went through that by myself. I didn't have a boyfriend. Um, but yeah, I did go through therapy, and I think therapy is very, very important. What about sex? Are you terrified of it? No. Has it changed it for you? It hasn't for me. No, it Good. hasn't changed it. What can a rape victim do, Valerie, if she's thinking about getting married? What steps mentally, emotionally, should she go through to help herself? Um, a rape survivor should definitely have discussed it with her fiancé. It should not be a secret. If it's a secret, um, it's going to come out at some point because of the private impact it has. She should not live in secrecy and shame. She should discuss it with her fiancé. She should face it, be able to tell her family and her friends. It is not something she should be ashamed of. Or she take full is, responsibility for. Right. No way. Which is a lot of what we, a lot of women do. So if she faces it, her chances are very, very good. It does take time, as okay. any tragedy in your life takes time. Right. The healing process is continual. Forever? Forever. Yes. Forever. Never ends. Interesting. I wish you great luck. With Thank this. you. You'll do it. Stay with us. We'll be right back. incredibly famous would you use his name to ensure your own success perhaps no 
No, I wouldn't. <laughs> Pay no attention Crazy? to her. I wouldn't, because then if I achieved success, I'd like to know that I achieved it because I deserved it, not because my father was famous. Hmm. Oh, that's so practical, <laughs> isn't it? Is. Very commendable. <laughs> not me. Our next guest worked hard at not being the daughter of a famous father. I'm going to have to talk to her about this. And at one point in her career, even thought of using her first name only. She is a great artist in her own right, a great success and a most dramatic personality. Please welcome Paloma Picasso. Yes. How are you? Good to see Fine. you. Was the need not to use your famous father's name? Was that because you just needed to do it on your own? You felt well, that? Well, because, you know, I mean, it's, you can't identify with something you've not created yourself, in a way. And I think that's what it is. I mean, you get a name from birth. And Paloma was at least a name that I didn't share with many people, so I felt mm -hmm. very, very identified with that part of my name. And the Picasso is a little heavy to carry when you're trying to do something on your own. Paloma means dove. That's right. And that is also part of your insignia? Uh, not really. No. no. Somehow it's such an obvious thing to do that I, I, I actually didn't do it, even though now I have finally done some things with dove, but, but uh, not as a starter. Right. You said, you, this is a quote which I love a lot, that your husband has been the architect of your career. It's true. Is it true? Uh -huh. In what way? Well, he really put this whole thing together. I mean, I was, you know, a designer before that, but I was doing things on a minor scale. And he said, you know, why don't you do it for real? I mean, why don't you fight with, you know, uh, to be at the top? And he also mentioned something about your name, that you should be as big as your name. Yeah, it's like you, f you have to fill up, you know, the <laughs> yeah, names. Right. <laughs> it's a pretty big name. Right. There's a yeah. cute story of you with your dad. Um, you wanted a pair of white sneakers. Tell oh, us yes. that story. So I was given this white pair of sneakers, and I was so proud of them. I went to my father and said, look at my beautiful white sneakers. And he looked at them and said, oh, they're really great. And then he grabbed a pen and started making little drawings on it. And actually, I remember in blue and red. And he gave them back to me very proudly. And I thought I was so Upset. horrified. <laughs> I just wanted a white <laughs> pair of sneakers. And I knew, you know, I was just like seven years old, but I knew anybody would kill their mother to get these <laughs> pair of sneakers. That's true. And so but Dad, that was not what did I you keep them? Right. Or do you still have them? That's a sad story. I don't no, have them. No. I'd be so happy now. Yeah, I wear them around. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, I can sort of yeah. etch them in gold, maybe, and <laughs> hang them around your neck. You right. know, your ads are very aggressive. They're very strong. Mm -hmm. They really make a statement. And to know you, you are the most, well, I don't want to say soft, but the most feminine lady. The, uh, is that part of you? A strong But part? I think it's part, you know, I mean, we're all, you know, one thing and very often it's opposite. And I think because I am basically rather shy as a person, I had to pick up a big front to say, to say you know, it. this is it. But all, all, it's a way maybe of saying, you know, stay away from me. Maybe. Because maybe I'm more afraid yeah, of maybe. them than they are of me. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Was <laughs> commercial success very important to you? Uh, I think it is. It's the only way that you can measure success. Yeah. And uh, coming from a, an artistic family and wanting to be doing something on my own, uh, we felt with Raphael, who also comes from an artistic background, because he's actually Raphael a playwright. Raphael is your husband. That's yeah. right. He's a playwright and a director, so his background was art and certainly not business. But we thought, you know, we have to prove that we can go to that new world, uh, you know, enter the, the commercial yeah. field, and yeah. it's like playing Monopoly, and yeah. you know, and make it big. Yeah. Let's see what well, we've done. <laughs> she brought lots of stuff for us Let's to look at. Right Come on, here. Paloma. Let's do take a peek. In? Yes. Okay. Beautiful. Where do you want to start? From over here? Over here, I think. Okay. I'll okay. get on this side. All right. Now, tell her. Oh, here's one this of these beautiful yes. shawls these and bags. Are gorgeous. So again, I mean, it's the the play here, the play of color, really happens with the the, the different kind of, of support that it's on. You know, on the shiny silk it becomes like a different color than than the background but it's really the same color and again it's your I scarves like have that too mm -hmm. let me just move over here behind okay here. and your these belts? of course are the bags those, yeah those are sort of fancy day bags or actually i mean you could go to a, and a dinner yes you could i could go with this <laughs> right, right now there. as a matter of fact absolutely in fact i just might <laughs> and look at this yes. her famous paloma red that i'm wearing that famous obviously famous lipstick and of course, your line, you do so many things. You make Well, that's a fun thing, perfume. you know, because with the perfume, I mean, once you've done the perfume, you get, you know, 
you you have to start getting bored. You have to do something more. Oh, there she goes. Yeah. <laughs> and and then so now, I've, you know, everything I design the package and also work on, on, on the product. And then, of course, your this is for this the is home. So now. Exactly. So That's I've been working on accessories always. And this is accessories not for directly for us, but for the house. Beautiful. Beautiful. Mm. And here are some gorgeous bags. Can now I tell Paloma, yeah, what is I'm this over here? Th this will be good news for everybody. Yes. Explain right. what this line is. Okay, so this is a less expensive line. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this I call by Paloma Picasso because actually with my husband we looked for a name and every time we got a good name somebody had thought of it before us. Right. So we finally thought, well, after all, what is it? It's made by Paloma Picasso, so that's the name of it. And scarves, bags. And scarves, bags, and uh, small leather goods. Now, and is things that like the that. dove? Is that the dove right, right there on that bag? Can that's not see a dove. The I'm sorry to say, it's, it's a leaf. That's what I thought it was. <laughs> that's leaf. why I said oh, it's that. A it's a leaf. <laughs> Oh, it's, it's a on leaf. the side. Uh -huh. It's a leaf. It's a leaf. It's a leaf. Well, I'm going to pretend it's a dove. Why don't you okay, just buy this and then you'll <laughs> never forget. And I'll hold it like that. But, but actually, it's funny because from that leaf, I thought that it looked a bit like a dove. So finally, then I made the dove. Oh, she's you trying see? to be nice. No, but she's, she's so wonderful. charming. <laughs> yeah. Now, look at this, everybody. I'm just going to show you some of the inventiveness and style of this lady. Is this so you get wonderful? your hands through it. Yeah. I had, of like course, to take my big ring off to make it work. but. Let like us that. also show this ring. Where, here we go. <laughs> Real quick. Can you yeah, see no, this? I'd Is better get it back gorgeous? before you steal it away that's from me. That's right. Well, <laughs> well, that's more her. You better watch her. It's the ultimate. You are. Thank Absolutely you for coming. Absolutely beautiful. Continue okay. success. Lord knows you don't need <laughs> it. Paloma Thank you. Picasso, everyone. Stay with us. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Would you refuse treatment by a health care practitioner that was HIV positive? No, I wouldn't. As long as the usual safety precautions were observed, it wouldn't bother me one bit. Not at all. What about you? I would. Um, I just think the ang anxiety level in my life would be too high um, to have to deal with that. I mean, the, the concern every day, you know, you wouldn't, you're, you're, we're really never sure what was going to um, pop up. and. <laughs> Okay. So I, w I would definitely refuse. Okay. You know, we've all heard of a patient's right to privacy, but what if the healthcare worker was HIV positive? Currently, the Center for D Disease Control has not released a policy pertaining to transmission of HIV from healthcare worker to patient. Should this be an issue at all? To discuss this, we have with us today Roger Petty John, an HIV positive nurse and Christopher O'Hare, Executive Director of the National Traditionalist Caucus. Please welcome them. Roger, let me begin Hi. with you. When were you diagnosed? Um, I was diagnosed with AIDS in January of 87. And when you found out, what did you do next? Um, actually, at that time, I was very sick, and I went out on disability at that time. In looking back, because that's four years ago, would you have done the same thing? Actually, no, I wouldn't have. Um, I, at that point, I figured I had only a year maybe to live and that uh, I wanted to take the time. One, I was too sick to work, and two, when I got feeling better, I felt I wanted to take the time to enjoy what time I had left. Um, now it's four years later. I'm still healthy. I'm still doing well uh, with occasional problems. So um, I discourage people from going out on disability early now. Do you ever feel afraid that you could transmit tra transmit uh, uh, this virus to a patient? No, I don't, because the one thing we've studied more than anything else in, in AIDS research has been transmission. And we know that there are only two ways in which you can spread AIDS. One is through contact with infected blood, and the other is contact with in, through sexual intercourse, either with seminal fluid or vaginal secretions. So that those things don't happen in normal patient care. Um, if I'm drawing blood, it's the patient's blood, you know, which is dealing with, they're not dealing with my blood. Right. So the opportunity for the patient to become infected from my work with them doesn't present itself. Do, do the people around you, the other workers, the nurses, the doctors, do they feel troubled by you being there? Um, I think there are some people who there's an initial concern about it. Um, but those of us who now have worked for 10 years in this epidemic, 
um, have become more comfortable with our knowledge base. And like anything else, the more you know and understand about something, the less afraid you are of, of fears you may have if you don't understand the facts that are involved. Now, you couldn't have ever been fired from being a nurse, correct? If you were discovered that you had HIV positive and, and you announced it, they couldn't fire you. You're protected, are you not? In the state of New York, we are. You That's are. not true um, in, in other states Across necessarily. It de depends state by state. And now that the ADA has been passed, the um, AIDS to Disability Act, um, that may make a difference mm -hmm. because um, people with HIV infection are protected as disabled persons. I know that there are other diseases that are much more easily transmitted than HIV positive. Sure. And yet it's this AIDS virus that has been singled out. I understand that it's because of the fear of it, but are we overreacting? I think so. I think there are two things. In this country, we tr always treat sexually transmitted diseases very differently than we treat any other disease. Um, there's a connotation that's carried with them that, that we don't put on other diseases. And I think that's very much part of the AIDS phobia that comes out of our own sex phobia and sex right. disease phobia that we have. Um, so that in, in that regard, I think that it is treated very differently. And you're absolutely correct. There are other diseases that are much more concerned. Mm. Christopher. Yes. What do you think? Do you think that we should have mandatory HIV testing for all health care workers? Yes. And if we do, doesn't it cost us taxpayers money? What's the cost of uh, treating more patients? If the risk of one more patient getting AIDS because of an accident, you know, I'm not questioning anybody's integrity that they would ever purposely try to infect a patient, but accidents happen. If that happens, the cost to human life is far more than the cost of dollars. Isn't the testing of health care workers, isn't it an invasion of privacy? Isn't it against our constitutional rights, though? What about the, okay, about doctors treating patients? What about the right of the patient? The patient's rights, like myself, I would not want to be treated by a healthcare worker who, who's HIV positive. Do you think Roger should be treating patients? Uh, AIDS patients. Just AIDS patients? Yes. And Roger believes he should treat all patients? Right. That's what he believes. I disagree with him. I believe he's wrong. And if they do allow HIV positive health care workers to treat patients, they should at least allow the patients to be informed so that they can make a, a choice for themselves. If they're not informed, if I go to a doctor who's HIV positive, which is something I wouldn't want to do, I don't know. That's taking away my rights. Mm -hmm. And the rights of the general community with the, the whole AIDS epidemic are being violated in the interest of protecting the rights of AIDS victims. My, my only thing about this would be uh, with a patient, if you're sick and you're in a hospital and you need care, I think the last thing you should have to decide is that. It is, you're saying that it you has to be the patient be. You shouldn't should have decide to. this? No, I'm saying that they shouldn't allow it. But if they are going to allow it, they have to allow the patient to know about it. Mm. Okay. I'm going out into the audience because we have some comments from everybody. Everybody's going to tell everybody else what they think. This is a very interesting subject. All right, who wants to say something? Please stand up. Hi. I, I was hospitalized a month ago with major surgery. It never once occurred to me to ask if any of the health care workers were HIV positive. Would it have upset you if someone working on you was HIV positive? No. I, um, I only saw dedicated, hardworking people who followed every rule. They were meticulous. They were neat. They were incredibly caring. I, I would not discourage anyone to not work in the healthcare profession if, if they're caring individuals, regardless of whether they had the virus, because there are so few. There are so few. They're so underworked. Uh, uh, no, I'm sorry. They're so overworked and understaffed. It's, it's really tragic that the healthcare system has to be taking the brunt of this HIV controversy because they're, they're great people, every one of them. Okay. Who else? Yes, stand up, please. Yes. You know, we hear a lot about truth in advertising today about uh, consumer goods and services. Why is it not our right as consumers to demand that those who have HIV be informed to us that they do have HIV before they treat us? I think that's only common sense that we have that right. Uh, let me say, Linda, also an answer to a question you asked, you asked before. One of the reasons that we are so concerned about sexually transmitted diseases, not just AIDS, is because they are so much more damaging and deep-reaching in their effects on us. 
Even other sexually transmitted diseases can make us blind, do damage to our hearts, livers, and other uh, vital organs. Uh, AIDS, uh, there's still no known cure to it. We don't know that it is only uh, transmitted by just the methods that you mentioned. Those are the, maybe the only methods known at the moment. There are other uh, methods of transmission which we may not know yet, including by mosquito bite. So I think we have a right to be protected about that way. So do you think that Roger should not be allowed to practice nursing? Only to HIV patients or to those to whom he makes known that he has HIV and who otherwise accept it. Okay. Anyone else want to say anything? Yes, please send up. Yes, hi. Um, I, if I were a patient in a hospital and uh, the, uh, um, the hospital board had approved that this nurse could practice, I wouldn't have any fears of, uh, of them treating me. You wouldn't? No. Okay. But that's you. What about those who would have fears? I think the rights, everybody's talking about rights, but the rights of the general, general community are being ignored for the rights of a special group. And that's not constitutional. Roger? That's not legal or right. I, what do you I want to say? I think the issue people? here is, is that the patient is not at risk, and that's what I keep hearing you being ignored. You don't know ignored. that. Yes, we do. Accidents uh, happen. These, these are totally erroneous statements to say that mosquito bites, that issue has been looked at and looked at and looked at. It's absolutely absurd, you know. The, you have to have contact with infected organisms. The organisms only exist in sufficient quantity in blood, in semen, or in vaginal secretions. That's it. What about an accident? It's, it's not a what question. What about a what, Chris in, in an accident, a, the doctor in uh, Montefiore Hospital, I can't recall her name, who, it was from a patient to the doctor, though, it was an accident. It was precautions were taken, accidents still happen. Now, a doc, this woman doctor has AIDS and is dying of AIDS. What about the patients, then? An accident could happen in the other direction. Okay, but patients aren't sticking us to get our blood. We're sticking them to get their blood. Accidents so, can happen. So they aren't going to stick us. She got, she got stuck by an, uh, uh, a suture, a needle. She got stuck by a, a needle, needle. That, was, that had been used on a person who has AIDS and therefore be, could have become infected with her blood. The other important thing is to remember in that case is she had had two abortions, which means she had had a considerable amount of unsafe sex in her life. So there was always question in that case where she was infected, Gentlemen, and it's impossible to say. I thank you both for being here. Um, it's an issue we're going to all have to deal with. Stay with us. We'll be right back. her favorite fashion item, blue jeans, into a mini empire. She even appeared on the cover of the prestigious Women's Wear Daily. And she accomplished most of this while she stayed home sick from school. Let's meet this fashion wonder, Ivy Silverstein. Hi, Ivy. Hi. 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 Were you really home sick from school? Uh, well, in all actuality, I had the chicken pox, and, and I couldn't, I couldn't attend classes, and I started um, making fashions basically that I wanted to wear but I couldn't find. From college? From college. Well, and everybody, all your friends loved it and everybody voila, they went wild. A mini it. empire was born. <laughs> well, let's all right. see it. Right. Let's see some of these clothes. Come on out, kids. This is Rachel. She's wearing the bell bottom blues outfit. That's Quite a bad one. Yeah. Did yeah, all your friends right back in? Did all, did all your friends want you to give them some? Everybody, <laughs> everybody has, a, you know, a piece of my line, I think. So what friends. you do is you take regular jeans mm -hmm. and jackets and vests like this, and you decorate them. Exactly. Right? This, uh, these appliques I made myself. <coughs> They're wow. stars are embroidered. This is um, in DNR. This, now, this how week. much would a pair of pants like that cost? Uh, I'd say probably about $185. $185? Now, could somebody bring you a, a, a jean and then have you decorate it? Do you do that? No, no. I do not. It's strictly my design. <laughs> but I'd save myself a little money. This dog is <laughs> flying around there in that bag. Look at his face. Just, that's Butch, that's everyone. Butch. Say hello, Butch. Okay. Oh, look at this. Yeah, this, this is the fancy fringe outfit. Where was Charo when, she, <laughs> when this was happening? This oh. is perfect for her. Now, yeah. you made the bra as well. I made the bra as well. Sure. I really, I really do a little bit of everything. That's quite something. Did you start out in life wanting to be a fashion designer? Yeah, this is something I've been doing ever since I was a little girl. You were a little girl. kid? Ever since I was a little girl, it was something I was doing. And you know what it was? I was in school and I 
I was a little bit confused. I never thought that you can make something that you enjoy into your profession. I didn't know I could take a hobby and make it into a profession. Yeah, that's the best And really enjoy my life, yeah. yeah. How long have you been doing this now? Oh, about nine months. Brand new. Yeah. And how's it going? It's incredible. You're, you're in a lot of stores. We can find you in you a lot can of find places. Me, you can find me in the city, like in Billy Martin's and Untitled's and okay. California and Fred Siegel. Basically, I mean, everywhere I go, they sell. I sell to any store I walk into, they buy it. Great. Great. That's a lucky girl. All right. Congratulations. A new fashion maven, and everybody. Talented. And that's it for us. See you we'll next see you